Greetings, folks. Uh, welcome to the Lava and Garden Show, otherwise known as the Grumpy Gardeners 15 Minutes of Flame. <laughs> I'm telling you, I am still the, the Grumpy Gardener this morning because my foot's feeling a little better. The ankle's getting better, but it's moved up to the knee now, you know, and so. It's working its way out. Gradually I'll get back to normal, but this is going to be a little while. Um, I want to thank all of you for your suggestions that you made about dealing with gout. The um, vast majority of it I already kind of knew. There wasn't too much new information coming my way. Uh, I learned a few things, definitely. You know, one of them was positively there are more people suffering from this out there than I ever really realized. Uh, I mean, truly, I, I never talk about it much because I'm not particularly proud of the fact that I have, a, you know, a bodily defect that's causing this issue. Uh, it's been pretty much lifelong. So, you know, it's I, I, I don't bring it up much. So, having brought it up, I suddenly realize, oh, my goodness, I get all these people come back to me and say, oh, yeah, I got that problem too, here's what we do, you know, and so on. And uh, I was at the dentist yesterday, uh, and, well, Harvey said, oh, yeah, I got that problem too. And, uh, well, he passed along cranberry juice, um, which was his go-to. And I said, well, Harvey, you know, um, me and cranberries... It, that's that's a political impossibility. I do not like cranberry farming. A uh, couple of reasons. One is that ocean spray is a monopoly that really covers almost every farmer that grows these silly things. See, it, there's one source that your stuff goes through. I don't like that at all. I am a decentralized, uh, I think small, small is beautiful and so on. I don't like mega corporations that handle a particular thing like that. And so uh, politically it's kind of bad, but then my neighbor in Wisconsin was a cranberry farmer, and uh, I had to live next door to him. And, uh, boy, I tell you, back in the 60s, we had a cranberry scare where the insecticides that were being used on the cranberries not only poisoned people, but they poisoned whole bodies of water, lakes, streams, and so on. Uh, Wisconsin suffered badly from the 1960s cranberry scare. Uh, there were still dead zones in my neighborhood caused by old cranberry farms. Um, the, uh, the laws were changed and so the chemicals they would use later on on cranberries uh, were altered, but um, I don't think they were any better because I'd drop by my neighbor and I'd say, hey Carl, how you doing? He'd be out there, he'd have this huge rubber apron on, huge rubber gauntlets, a gas mask, Okay, and he'd have this glass bottle encased in wood with a big skull and crossbones imprinted on it. He'd be taking an eyedropper, pulling up stuff out of this bottle and dropping it into the water of the cranberry bugs. And he'd be going, yeah, oh, darn, Billy, you know, that stuff they used to give us, it used to work. This stuff, it don't work. He's got a gas mask, rubber, you know, an eyedropper and a whole bog. Whew, no way, man, you know. And then, of course, cranberries, most of us cannot eat the silly things without piling in huge amounts of sugar. Now, what's the point? You know, I mean, it's strawberry sweet, raspberry sweet, blackberry sweet, blueberry sweet. All these things are naturally right off the bush perfect. You know, um, I understand why Native Americans ate the cranberry. They were abundant. They, uh, they would stay late into the fall. And while I fished in the upper Midwest in fall, I, I would often run across floating bog islands that would have the cranberries growing wild. And in wild, we used to gather them and eat them, and they were refreshing, uh, tart but refreshing while out fishing, you know. Uh, and so, I don't have any problem with the wild berry per se, but the way it came into our culture, I don't want anything to do with them cranberries. Not a bit. Um, so, uh, for me, the go to is uh, Roselle, that is fruity hibiscus, and tart cherry juice. Uh, the, uh, the Roselle grows here in my garden in Hawaii, and it is uh, palatable as tea without adding sugar to it. A little better when you do add sugar. But the tart cherry juice, which I have to bring from the mainland, it concentrates. Uh, and that uh, is perfect as it is. Anyway, uh, you know, some of this was caused by the fact that I ran out of tart cherry juice, ran out of Roselle. Uh, forgot to put turmeric in my food because I didn't want to walk 20 feet into the garden to harvest some, you know, 
laziness, short-sightedness, and then of course too many pinto beans. And now maybe I'm discovering too that I eat a lot of raw tuna here, ahi. And it looks like ahi may have quite a bit of purines in it too. And so I'm going to have to learn how to limit my intake of what I consider to be a really scrumptious food. Um, other things will go first. Ahi will disappear off the menu before beer. Thank you. Um, and yeah, then uh, I, it also was brought to my attention about a few drugs I didn't know that were being used uh, to treat gout. Um, and uh, although, unfortunately, I thought colchicine was expensive when they're trying to nail me for over 150 bucks a bottle for that stuff. Uh, I was given a, another drug uh, by one of the viewers that he uses that's like 800 bucks a week, I think, or something on the, a very, 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 very expensive pharmaceutical. Uh, well, you know, I, I have Medicare, you know, I'm of that age where we get to pick that stuff up because we paid for it our whole life, and it's not really worth a hoot, frankly, it's only good for disasters, <laughs> it's about all, uh, you know, as far as your general health is concerned, it's, it's not good for much, and then of course they talk about the donut hole, which is mostly prescriptions, which are not covered by it, so I have the Part B that supposedly pays for prescriptions, but I pay more for that insurance every year than I actually use in the value of any prescriptions I take because I don't hardly take any, you know. And uh, so anytime anybody starts talking about expensive drugs, well, they're not covered by Medicare anyway. And uh, I, I definitely, uh, uh, I oppose the idea of a pharmacy holding our health uh, over us. I mean, these guys all know, you know, we're suffering. Gout drugs are so expensive because people are in agony when they get this stuff. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's drug pushers and drug pushers. I don't care whether they have big corporate offices or whether they drive around in a pink Cadillac. Uh, they're drug pushers, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want anything to do with them. The healthcare system in our country, because of the fact that it's based on capitalism, is broken. Because healthcare should be more of a human right and a lot less of a business from my point of view. Because a stable society is based on the health of its citizens. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, as far as these drugs are concerned, though, a little comic relief here because I don't know how many of you you know uh, watch network television at times and find that you're I mean, like I'm trying to watch the nightly news and every commercial that comes up, every one of them is about some pharmaceutical, you know, and the pharmaceuticals all got strange little cutesy names they throw at you and they make sure that you get the name. The name keeps coming at you, coming at you, coming at you, and then they, of course there's people dancing around in fields of flowers. They're all so happy, you know, and I see this and I go, oh man, I need that drug. Oh, look at those people. They're so happy. And I go talk to my doctor. I go, doc, let me have, you know, this stuff. I saw it. At the he says, well, dude, that's for menopause. You don't get menopause. Oh, but they were so happy, you know. Really, the truth is that other than the names of the drugs and these people dancing around, the only thing I ever catch that really sticks with me, that's the side effects. Anybody ever notice this, huh? The side effects. It's like terlipsity. Okay, Terlipsity, uh, it's only $10,000 per dose, you know, uh, and if you have trouble paying for it, contact your physician, because he may have a coupon to be able to help you, because always when it comes to drugs, the first one is free, <laughs> you know, and then side effects, of course, include nausea, blindness, diarrhea, vomiting, um, and growing a scrotum on your chin, you know. It's like it's ridiculous. All I ever get is the name of the drug and the side effects. Those are the two things that impact me. And I don't have these commercials you're supposed to work on other people. Maybe maybe they do. I don't know. They don't work on me because I just walk away in terror. I'm tired of it. I, I remember a day when we didn't advertise pharmaceuticals on television, uh, and I really w wish we could go back to that. Because uh, tell you what, drug companies, if you're out there listening. Those commercials, they don't work. Not on Bill, because all I see is the name of your drug and all the side effects that are scarier than whatever it was your drug was trying to treat. You know, and truly because I am Mr. Side Effect. All right, I get side effects from drugs that aren't even listed in the label. You know, um, 
really, it's like, you know, they get these, these common side effects, you know, lesser common side effects, and then like 1% of the population uh, will grow a cherry in the middle of their forehead. That's me. You know, that's, that's who I am. And so side effects are a serious business for me. Um, I was looking at the paper the other day, right there, and it says, value of aisle seed crops drops 19%. Um, well, that sounds bad, maybe, right? Uh, but actually, when you look at this, you find out that all the people who were here who were raising seeds were raising genetically modified corn, you know? So this is a GMO manufacturers that are uh, losing 19% over here. Um, that would be Bex, Dow, Monsanto, uh, Syngenta, you know, these guys... Um, and it's on a few of the islands. It's on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and uh, Molokai. Uh, the big island was not mentioned because if they tried to grow GMO corn here, they would have punatics with pitchforks storming the gates. Not a popular business on this island at all. And it's back to uh, dangerous chemicals. This is the garden agricultural portion <laughs> of the Lava Garden Show here today. Uh, dangerous chemicals, yes. Um, previous uh, EPAs, <laughs> back when science was important to the EPA, you know, and they didn't draw their information from scripture. Um, the scientists that worked for the EPA had uh, had stated that uh, uh, chloropyrifos, which is very difficult to pronounce, and uh, I think it's probably the reason they wrote it that way, so we can't say it. The more common brand name of this is Durazban. All right? oh, easier to say. Durazban uh, was in the process of being banned by the Environmental Protection Agency. There were good scientific studies that indicated that uh, um, this stuff would reduce IQ, it would reduce memory, and it also uh, seemed to reduce uh, attention. It created attention disorders in children. Um, and so that basically using it anywhere near schools and definitely prenatal to, we were finding conclusive evidence that uh, children couldn't think well anymore. Well, uh, you know, of course, in their infinite wisdom, when the Trumpy got in and he assigned Pruitt uh, into the EPA, and they immediately started to get rid of all science that they had backing anything, uh, and turned towards um, God knows what scriptures. I don't know what they're what they're using to verify this stuff, but they uh, they overturned the ban. They're not gonna they're not gonna ban it. Uh, the Pruitt EPA will not ban uh, Duras ban. And so, in reaction, the state of Hawaii, realizing that they had made, uh, uh, the federal government is making a serious error, uh, they, in turn, um, just yesterday, decided to put a state ban on the use. So, here in Hawaii, we will be safe from this chemical, and children will probably still be able to kind of think. But uh, uh, as far as the rest of you in the mainland, California has been thinking about it. There's a few other states uh, concerning themselves with it. Uh, you know, Durasban is part of that family tree of organophosphates that uh, chloridane, DDT, uh, diazinon all belong to. And so this is gradually, they've been knocking them off. I mean, you know, DDT, the eagle shells, uh, eggshells got soft and cracked, and it was killing off all kinds of things other than insects. and. Um, most of these other chemicals have well been proven to be very, very dangerous uh, to uh, uh, most warm-blooded forms of life. And they were trying to kill cold-blooded stuff. Um, and so the, that wasn't working out. Of course, the reason it, it was that effective on warm-blooded is because uh, most of the science that these insecticides came from were based on World War II nerve agents for troops. And after the war, they decided that they'd take the chemistry and they'd use it to kill insects instead. And so we've gradually been banning this stuff as we get smarter and we realize the dangers of most of it. But the profits are still there, and I mean, we can decide with uh, Pruitt and Trump's administration here uh, why they would decide to overturn the science. Um, and I guess they think they're supporting the people who have the patents on it so they can make money. Uh, that would be probably one rational thought. The other, more a little irrational thought, and that is that uh, I think guys like Trump, for instance, really approve the idea that the upcoming generations will be stupider than the last one, won't be able to remember anything, you know, and so on, because it's going to be better for their votes. Uh, so, 
you know, I am getting, getting kicked around out here uh, by people who support this administration because I don't like them at all. And, um, you know, anybody who hears this and you take offense at it, I'm sorry. It's tough. <laughs> it's tough. So current reports indicate that we got a uh, oh, $14 million farm loss on the Big Island due to the volcano eruption here. Uh, they say that 20 major farmers in that region have been shut down. Now, this doesn't count for a lot of the minor farmers. I mean, technically, I consider myself here to be a farmer, although I wouldn't show up in the state's count because I don't have 100 acres of papayas, you know. But we have so many small growers here that, uh, that do count to themselves, you know, and to maybe people around them uh, that aren't being included in this. But they, they're running out, $14 million loss. That's mostly in uh, papayas uh, and floral industry is what they're counting. And there was a lot of production down in that region. We'll make up for it somehow, somewhere, but it's a big one. So moving right along to the 15 minutes of flame, um, here I have some images that we picked up the other night from the driveway. Things are still very exciting down there on the flow from here. Check this out. Yeah, beautiful. Painting the clouds red. Beautiful and unfortunately treacherous. Hmm. I'm hoping that this whole uh, uh, show going on down there in the southeast, it's so spectacular this evening that it's because of the way the clouds are, and it's not because the whole rift zone is opened up and is spewing lava everywhere. It looks like it's still just fissure number eight, I guess, but so much. And it's like, it's like a sunrise or a sunset. It's that powerful. The reports I get are that Fisher number 8 has been producing 26,000 gallons of lava per second. Dude, that's a lot of lava. Okay. <laughs> that's big. Um, yeah, 26,000 gallons per second out of Fisher number 8. They say the fountains have been as high as 14-story uh, buildings. Now, they had been previously higher than that, but currently uh, a 14-story building is the limit. That's a big building. We don't have very many buildings on the big island that are 14 stories high. It's like, actually, it's a good question. We even have one. I, I'm not aware of it. So that's uh, the fountains are higher than most buildings right here on the island. That's a pretty good deal. Um, and then uh, the Jagger Museum. Folks who've been here to the island have visited the Volcanoes National Park up here. You all know the Jagger Museum. That's that uh, building right there on the rim of Kilauea where everybody gathers to overlook, see the lava lakes and stuff. Well, the, the uh, overlook has been damaged pretty good. There's cracks and stuff in all the pavement. Um, looking at it, you can see here from this photo... that it looks like a snowstorm. The entire thing is covered in uh, white-gray ash. The Jagger Museum is uh, a kind of uh, messed up. That was the pit stop for everybody that came here. So It appears uh, that there aren't enough homes for sale available here on the island to accommodate all the people that lost their houses. Uh, mayor the other day said something about, uh, I think, approximately 700 homes, but I didn't really count the ones who were unpermitted. Uh, so that nobody really knows exactly how many, but it's a lot, and the estimate is that we just don't have enough housing available over here uh, to be able to accommodate all the people that lost their houses. So let's hope that this problem doesn't continue to grow, because uh, if it does, it's really going to be get to be an issue. Anyway, hopefully the, uh, uh, the lack of housing here will uh, perhaps uh, increase building here on the island in new, safer locations because the, uh, the plan is still uh, uh, land swap. I'll try to get people out of Zone 1 and 2. I think it's a great idea. I hear a lot of opposition to it. I don't think the opposition is very well thought out, frankly. Um, I think it's for all of us in the long run, it's, wow, just the best idea ever. It's rather revolutionary. Uh, we have, there is a website currently, uh, 
kokua.alohaliving.com that's k-o-k-u-a dot aloha living um, that has been set up to help people find uh, temporary housing, to help them find rentals uh, it, it, it may even help direct some people towards you know homes they can buy and so on so there's some consideration to try to help people find a place to live um, you know this disaster here it is for the people affected definitely a disaster, but it is rather localized. You know, we're talking six or seven hundred homes in a specific region. I'm getting feedback from people in Puerto Rico after that last hurricane that they got hit by in the last hurricane season. One gentleman contacted me and says, Hey, Bill, congratulations. Nine months later, the lights came back on. Oh, man. You know, nine months and then I said well geez you know what happened to society in the period of time the lights were out well the list of stuff I got back that had gone sour since this occurred including suicides you know politicians robbing the coffers for repair da 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 da, da. we got nothing going on here. there's no disaster at all I'm serious um Boy, I tell you, on top of the lava flow, if it ever happened, we got busted by a hurricane, too. Because, you know, for Puerto Rico, the hurricane was pretty much island-wide, not localized. And uh, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. Not a state, but it's part of this country. Uh, <laughs> take it or leave it, like it or not. And, uh, oh, I ain't being treated too well over there. There's a lot of things that could have been done uh, that would speed this process up. Oh, you know, it also has to do with your leaders. I've been hearing some messages, too, uh, from folks about uh, the gemstones that are coming out of the volcano. Um, uh, apparently there's been quite a bit of peridot, that's the green gemstone um, that is produced here by the lava. Uh, it's actually very common here. Um, you know, I'm looking down here at my driveway gravel, for instance. i got a piece here that's got little sparkly green uh, crystals in it. Uh, it's very, very common material. It's in almost all the gravel we have around us. It's in beach gravel, you know. Every now and then when I find a nice lava rock that's got deposits of it in there, I bring it home and set it in the flower garden. Uh, it is the only gemstone that occurs on a volcanic island. Uh, everything here is lava. Everything is volcano. And so uh, uh, we don't get any other rubies or sapphires, you know, Pearls would be the closest other gemstone, which is not a stone, that we could find here. Um, you know, so this peridot is, is the local deal. Um, I guess under the circumstances it would be a nice contribution to uh, the local economy. I suppose to purchase peridot jewelry. That's pretty stuff. It's nice green. Um, you know, we have whole sands, uh, beaches. There's green sand beach uh, down there in Kau that's made pretty much out of the stone. Uh, stuff's all over the place. The biggest problem for us is finding a piece of it that's big enough to use it for anything. There's pieces of it everywhere, but it's not usually large enough. The crystals are very small in most cases. I, I have good friends. Uh, one lady contacted me this morning from California referring to, uh, you know, Pele is still being angry uh, that uh, the eruptions continue. And you know, whether you believe in volcano goddesses or don't believe in them, it really doesn't matter. Uh, most of us here use that term, uh, you know, because the volcanoes do seem to have a bit of a personality to them. And the traditional belief is that Pele is uh, a goddess. But, you know, when it comes to being angry, I think anger is an act of the powerless. Pele is not powerless. But Pele is force, okay? She don't need to be angry. And it could be displeased, I guess, you know, and, and throw her weight around. Um, it's possible that she went right through the gates and some of these gated communities where people had been locked off from the shoreline because of others who wished to have that land private. Uh, some of that did happen. And, eh, maybe displeasure, I don't know. Uh, it's starting to rain out here. I'm getting wet. So I guess it's time to stop talking about duality in the universe. But the truth is, no lava, no volcanoes, no Hawaii, no paradise. Uh, you know, we tend with the mind 
to divide everything into dualities, that this is good, this is bad, this is evil, this is so on, you know. And I, I've had a lot of people jumping on me because I don't see the world in duels. I, everything here is one thing. That's the way I see it. There is no division except in our minds, and this is the same with this Pele thing. It might be painful, but the truth is when you live through painful experiences, it usually smelts the gold out of human character. And so what we call bad oftentimes is exactly what it was we need. Consider that. Aloha. Have a wonderful day, and I'm going to go inside before I get soaking wet. <laughs>